the one question that you might be thinking of right now is why should I even simplify the flow equations? How does it help me understand the complex real world flows? Let me answer your question by giving you a few examples. In this video, all we have is water coming out of a tap. Intuition tells us that this is a pretty simple flow. Here we have a car running at speeds in excess of 300 km per hour. With all the complicated aerodynamic structures, I think it is safe to say that this is not such a simple flow. Now, what if I told you that both of these flows can be described by making just one assumption? These flows can be classified under the assumption of incompressibility. Compressibility is the measure of the change in the density of the fluid due to the application of pressure. In an incompressible flow, the density of the fluid is relatively unaffected by the pressure forces that are applied because of the movement of the different bodies in the fluid. From a mathematical standpoint, by considering density to be constant, the Navier-Stokes equations can be transformed into their incompressible versions. Let us recall the conservation of the mass equation. Because of the assumption of constant density, this equation now transforms into the following form. This is the mass conservation equation for the incompressible flows. Similarly, the momentum conservation equations can be reduced to the form shown here. If we further assume that the specific heat and the thermal conductivity are also constants, the energy equation reduces to the form shown here. The incompressible equations are sufficient to fully describe most of the flows involving liquids such as water and gaseous flows at very low speeds. Another form of simplification of the Navier-Stokes equations can be made by assuming that the viscous forces in the fluid are negligible. That is, it is an inviscid flow. Viscosity is the measure of the friction between the different layers of fluid that are in relative motion. Most external fluid flow problems can be considered inviscid in regions away from the object. From a mathematical standpoint, the inviscid assumption implies that the molecular viscosity of the fluid can be neglected. With that simplification, the classical Navier-Stokes equations transform into the inviscid equations. These equations governing the inviscid flow are referred to as the Euler equations, named after Leonard Euler who discovered these equations. Till now, we looked at how the governing equations of the fluid motion change under the assumptions of incompressibility and inviscid separately. Let us now look at how the equations transform when both of these assumptions are applied simultaneously. Beginning with the Euler equations, if we now impose the condition of constant density, that is, the flow is incompressible, the mass and the momentum equations transform to the following form. Using vector calculus identities and also realizing that the curl of velocity is nothing but vorticity, we can rewrite the momentum equation as shown here. These equations now represent the incompressible inviscid form of the Navier-Stokes equations. If we additionally assume that the flow is invariant with time, that is a steady state flow, and that the vorticity of the flow is negligible, the momentum equation can be rewritten in the form shown here. This equation just means that the gradient of the term in the brackets is zero, meaning that the term should be a constant. If this looks familiar, then you are correct. It is the general form of the famous Bernoulli's principle. 
The Bernoulli's equation represents the conservation of energy in the fluid. Each of these terms stand for the internal, kinetic and the potential energy of the fluid respectively. Since the sum of these terms is constant everywhere in the fluid domain, most applications of the Bernoulli's equations calculate the value of the constant based on the far field values and use the constant to calculate the flow properties at other locations. Based on the Bernoulli's equation, we can define a crucial flow property called the total or the stagnation pressure. In the Bernoulli's equation, if we assume that the potential energy of the fluid is negligible, we are left with just two terms. The first term is the pressure in the fluid and is also called the static pressure. The second term, in addition to being the kinetic energy of the fluid, has the units of pressure and is so referred to as the dynamic pressure. The sum of these two terms is referred to as the total pressure. In plain words, total pressure is defined as the pressure which would exist if a moving fluid was brought to rest without losses. Bernoulli's principle has many applications, including the estimation of lift force generated by an aircraft wing, calculation of air speed using pitot tube and many more. What do we do with these equations? Well, in the next lesson, we will look at how we can go about solving these equations for some very fundamental flows to obtain analytical solutions.